take three perspectives on this, just to give a slightly personal take on it. The first perspective is from many years ago when I was a young faculty member in the US and one of our responsibilities was to give international exposure to our students. So by our students, I mean at that point students in the US. And so the question then became that how do you get students to be interested in going to other countries, in particular India? Now obviously given my nationality, there was particular attention among the faculty there to say that I promote my own home country. So who were the students who would be interested in going to India to study? Number one, obviously Indian or people of Indian heritage. Number two, students from all over the world who are interested in getting a broad spectrum view of life, highs and lows, various aspects of it. And if you take such a view, India is a great destination from any teenagers or any students perspective. So such students would typically come to India and they would like to spend time, for example, teaching in a village or working with an NGO or training employees or simply traveling. The second part of my journey uh, in India now is a part of a corporation, a multinational corporation working in India and our objective is to get students interested to come, not necessarily from the US but from any part of the world. So from this perspective, why would students be interested in coming to India? Initially, the reason was again similar, that it is a somewhat exotic location to come to India. The other location, that is, if you are of Indian heritage, it's a good opportunity to come home, or your extended definition of home, and a good opportunity to spend time, maybe holidays, see extended family, etc., if you're first generation. And increasingly it became important to many students to come to India to see what the developing economy was like. What all the noise was about with respect to India, China and various countries. What is this strange thing that the developing world is doing and why should we care about it? And why are companies so keen to sell to these countries and what are they outsourcing from there? So a certain curiosity. We also saw the challenges and the opportunities of doing this, of dealing with foreign citizens who would come to India and registration offices, etc., uh, of settling them in, uh, of getting them acclimatized to India within a short period of time and then sending them back. Those were interesting times. And I'm on the third leg of, of where I am now, back in academia, but this time in India. And the challenge and the opportunity remains to get students interested and to get faculty interested again. So internationalization from an Indian academics perspective is of course in various dimensions. There's internationalization of students, there's internationalization of faculty, there's internationalization of work, you know, research or projects or whatever you would like to do. Now from the student's perspective, it is clearly much easier to get Indian students to go abroad than it is to get non-Indian students or international students to come to India. And one objective of this session is to understand why that is so. From a faculty perspective, the situation is the opposite. It's a lot easier to get international faculty to come to India to teach or to take sessions than to get Indian faculty to go abroad and be accepted and take similar sessions in universities there, which is an interesting dilemma to have. So the common benchmark appears to be that exchange programs are being set up, and these exchange programs are programs that are dual tone by agreement, which means that in the agreement, Students from any other country can come to India, students from India can go to any other country. And if it's with a university, with that specific university. But the traffic is much more one direction. And in the recent, uh, well, it's not recent anymore, but in the, for the previous government, with the Singh Obama agreements were being made, which are followed up by this government as well, then the discussion was certainly on as to how we can get this done the other way. As our Prime Minister said, to go from brain gain to brain gain, or what we would often call a reverse brain gain if you were to think of it. So combined with all these different experiences, it then boils down to saying that, number one, is this something that we want to do? In other words, get students from other countries to come and study in India. If so, what are the ways of possibly doing that? If not, are there other ways in which that same goal can be attained? For example, we talked a lot about digital technology and bringing Indian education abroad through digital means without the exchange of physical movement of people. And if we are still going to go back to physical people, then how do we attract students?
students or how do we attract students to come back to here. I close my argument by simply giving sort of one single point of view, again from the point of view of students as to why they would like to come. So think about it from a student's perspective who's in a non-Indian location and think about a non-Indian student, that is a student with no Indian heritage per se, and is thinking about India as an opportunity. Now, why would that be interesting? Now certainly the historical nature of the country, the dimensions that it gives, the, the religious dimension, the social dimension, all that matters and that remains very attractive. It's the same reason why India would be a tourist destination. And the theme of education, the theme of tourism would, would catch on, just like the theme of tourism and the theme of medicine is intersecting. The theme of education, the theme of tourism would then intersect in a similar kind of way. The other reason students would tend to come would be is that this would be a part of their core training and their core education. In other words, it makes sense to be in India in order to be a better professional, maybe in India or maybe in their own countries. Now why would that be? One reason could, it, could be that India is of particular importance in their business. If they are in the IT field, they will probably work for a company in which many employees are Indians. If they are in agriculture, then a lot of their supply chain may pass through agriculture. Increasingly more for components, for example, in automotives. So they may be in industries or they may be targeting industries where they know India is going to be a primary player. A second reason would be, and this is a this is a harder nail to back down, would be to say that you get quality education in India much as you would get elsewhere in the world. Which would mean that when you come here, the courses that you do, the transcript that you create is equivalent to anywhere else in the world. Now, I, the reason I say this is difficult is because it implies a lot of terms and conditions. Certain logistical things like are the credits equivalent? Do the syllabuses match? Certain more intangibles like is the faculty that is teaching you of comparable standard to the faculty that you are accustomed to in your home country? Because you would not want to devalue your home degrees. Those in many countries cost a great deal. In some countries they do not cost a great deal, but it is their state's so there are a number of dimensions to this. I'm sorry I'm being a little broad based on this, but I hope that we'll have a discussion around it. If there's opportunity for questions, uh, uh, we can take them up with the Chairman's permission. Uh, but just that, as a teacher, it's one view. As a corporate, it's one view. As an academic, now in India, it's another view. So this is a complex problem. We're looking for all of your help. We at Myra certainly are going to play our role in this together with our partner institutions. So. Thank you, Dr. Sikha. Uh, very broadly, 